Paul, I hope you had a good week. I did. I'm looking forward to the long weekend this weekend. Uh, what are you doing for Memorial Day? I'm staying home and doing nothing. Well, I mean, I'm probably, like, I'm probably just going to do my regular stuff, you know? I was joking over the... I was joking yesterday with my wife. Uh, she was like, oh, it's Memorial Day weekend. I was like, woo, three-day weekend. Because, of course, I can take a three-day, you know, like, I just pick my days that I want to laugh. <laughs> I'm, I right. just have to do my work. It doesn't matter when I take my days off. Um, but it's going to be Memorial Day weekend. It's going to be beautiful here. So we actually want to stay in because... We have schedules that allow us to do stuff on weekdays, like, uh, you know, on a Monday, we could go to the lake when nobody's there. So the right. last thing we want to do is go to the lake on, I mean, we have every Monday off, you know, she has every Monday off, so we can go, oh, right, we can right. go any, we can go any Monday. There's no reason to go this coming Monday. <laughs> that would be madness. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like. If you've got kids in school, it's like, oh, we want to be able to take the kids to a thing. And so it's like, it's got to happen on Memorial Day, right? It's like, well, yeah, but you're under right. no such constraints. Right. For those, leave the lake for people that have to do it on that day. Let them have their day. Nice. Well, speaking of having kids and stuff, I got a mailer, not just one mailer. Uh, so you know how, like, you get those big glossy mailers sometimes with, like, an advertisement for something? You know, we haven't gotten anything like that in age. We used to, you know, that used to be like every day, twice a day. You just get like, here's some crap that's for sale. Right. I haven't seen something like that in literally a couple of years. So we got this whole stack in the mail and it was like, it's from Blizzard and it's for this game. It's called uh, Sylph, I think. Um, and it, it's all fancy. It's got, you know, the characters on the front and some sort of MOBA multiplayer, I don't know, you know, some sort of game. But they sent one to each one of us, like myself and my wife and each one of my kids, because like we're all playing video games. And so they're like, oh, these are all gamers. It's like a gamer commune. Whoa, all these gamers have the same address and the same last name. Weird. What are the odds of that? Yeah. Yeah. We used to get stuff like that. Um, well, I would, I lived with my brother for a while. And so then we were just like, it was, it was off the hook because all of their junk mail came to us and all of our junk mail came to them. And then when we moved, like we all got each other's junk mail. It was just, it was bonkers. I don't know what we did. That we stopped getting junk mail. We, the big thing we used to get is like flyers just for local stores. Right. Right. Always printed out in color, but on like the cheapest paper in the universe. It's like, oh, yeah. free sandpaper. <laughs> Biodegradable. It's probably recycled from cardboard boxes or something. Right. So I looked up this game. Um, I was like, well, you know, as long as I went through the trouble of like sending me this mailer. And it turns out it was all a dream, Seamus. I dreamed the whole thing. I couldn't believe it. It was insane. No. I thought yes. it was weird that you were that you this happened with a game that you'd never like that I'd never heard of before. I thought, huh, I've been <laughs> yeah. out of the loop for the last <laughs> few weeks. I was like, what is going on? I sat down to my computer. I'm like, I got to look up those mailers that I got the other day. And it was like, nope, you dreamt that whole thing. I was, oh, I'm going weird. out of my mind. Oh, weird. So now I kind of wish they'd make it just because I mean, looked pretty sweet. They're obviously putting in the effort for the marketing. Direct to dream marketing. <laughs> Direct to dream market. So, um, one of the weird things that I've been having lately, this is complete this is not on the thing, but I know we we have a lean show this week, so I thought I would mention this. And it's freaking me out, and it's been going on for several weeks, basically since like my my kidney trouble got real bad. Mm. And I don't know if it's some of the medicine I'm on or just some changes to my body, but I transition in and out of sleep really, it used to be really hard. I would wake up and I would be like, Bleh. you know, my mouth is pasted shut. My eyes are like, you know, won't focus on anything completely disoriented. Your limbs are heavy, you know, 
you're waking up, you feel like crap. Right, right. And that hasn't been happening. And instead, when I wake up, I like, wait, was I asleep? I, I think it was just daydreaming. Look at the clock. Oh, well, no, I was not daydreaming for three hours. Oh, so weird. And just sit up and don't have the groggy feeling. And I don't know why. It seems like you'd expect it to be the other way, that it would get harder to get up as you get older and sicker. I don't know what it means. And I wonder if it, this is like, is it like this for other people all the time? You just wake up and you feel like, because this is how people wake up on TV. You know, they just open <laughs> right. their eyes and begin having a conversation. And I'm like, <laughs> bolt upright in bed. Right. They're like, oh boy, breakfast in bed. You know, and they're smiling. And when I do that, I'm like, what? Who's in my room? Oh my gosh, it's so bright. Oh, no, no, I don't want breakfast in bed. Look, I've got to pee so bad. <laughs> my joints hurt so bad. And I need to wash this horrible taste out of my mouth. The last thing I want is to have a conversation with any of you people. I can't tell who you are because my eyes won't focus. <laughs> but on TV, people just, yeah, like you said, just sit right up. Like, okay, we're doing the awake thing now. And that always looks just comical to me. But uh, I don't know about anyone else's experience, but I wake up pretty alert. Uh, and you have to kind of like when you got little kids, because it's like, what was that noise in the middle of the night? I better run in the bedroom, pick up the kid and take him to the toilet so they can throw up in the toilet instead of all over the floor. <laughs> right. <laughs> Heather used to do. I, I never even when we had kids, I was never that good at waking up. But Heather would, you know, uh, one of the kids would be sick and they'd be in the room with us and we'd hear <coughs> and I'd, there'd be this rush of noise and suddenly Heather's got them in the bed in the bathroom and I'm like I haven't even opened my eyes yet <laughs> yeah and whoever's on call registered yeah so I guess it's just been me well I mean I'm sure there's a spectrum yeah I I was always abnormally like when I was in college I would set an alarm but I would always wake up like one minute before the alarm, turn the alarm off and like throw my clothes on and, and run to class because I'd have the alarm set for like five minutes before class started. And it was just like, I right. could just do that. And everyone else is like, oh, what is going on? Right. So I, I don't know. I, yeah. I think you may be more normal than I am, but there's certainly a range. Right. He Heather always left. Heather is probably more like you. And she wakes up much more alert and she just sort of thinks it's comical the way I walk around, head down, high, eyes half open, and grunt at people. <laughs> do, do you want a cup of tea? Uh, do, or do you want breakfast? Uh, uh. And it's not like I'm trying to be a jerk, it's just like the speech center of my brain is still asleep. <laughs> yeah, and I've certainly had days like that. I, I mean, it's not normal, but you know, there are times when it's just like, oh man, what is happening today? It's like being hung over every morning. Ugh, man. I don't know what that's like. I've never been hung over. Thank God. N never. I've only been hung over for real once. And um wasn't worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it uh, doesn't seem like a, a good time. All right. So let me tell you about a video game I played. V Rising. Have you heard about this? I have not. All right, this is a, um, what is this? I mean, it's a game about being a vampire. And it's top-down pers perspective, kind of like Diablo, right? Okay. But it's like survival. Like perspective or something. Yeah, well, you can actually tilt the camera if you want. But, I mean, like, oh, look, I brought the camera down to a low angle and now everything's in the way. <laughs> that sucks. Let me put the camera back where it belongs. Back at three quarters. Yes. Uh, so this isn't like V for Vendetta V. This is like a different... No. No, it's it's a, it's V for... Um, Van Helsing, maybe. V for Wolfman. No, wait. That's, <laughs> no, it's, it's a vampire. Um, and um, so it's a very interesting game because it's survival crafting. Like, you've got to build a base and, you know shelter yourself but like this is this is a really common kind of game right survival crafting but 
in most games, it's build during the day and hide at night, and is a vampire that's inverted. And okay. it actually it actually uses the sun. Um, it uses shadows, like the real shadows. It's not just like, oh, you're in a building, so okay, you're in shadow. No, it is the angle of the shadows, and this becomes a strategic um, decision. Like if you've got a big tree near your property, maybe you don't want to cut that down because that's shelter for you. You know, if you're oh, not quite... Sure. Yeah, like if you haven't quite made it to the front door, you know, and this this is, happens to me every morning. It's like, oh crap, <laughs> sun's almost up. I'll sprint home. I've been out all night looking for stuff to kill. Um, because you, you you get to kill stuff and feed on their blood to like collect all this blood and then you use that to level up, right? So sure. But like I wander around all night and don't find anything, and then on the way home the sun's coming up and all of a sudden, oh wait, there's somebody. Oh, there's there's somebody I could. Oh, there's something. Oh crap, I don't have time. Ah. <laughs> so um, so maybe you want to leave trees up around your property, and yeah. Um, that that's that's a really interesting kind of thing and it, it gives you other tools like there's a this basin you can like burn stuff in and it'll fill the area with mist to give you kind of area shelter that's really useful at the beginning of the game when you don't have oh yeah yeah and very atmospheric too then you've got like the old abandoned house that's all surrounded by dead trees and smoke and stuff exactly and in fact that's where i tend to build my my base is i'll find some like looks sort of like an old church that's like fallen into disrepair it's just the walls there's no ceiling or anything but and there's no reason to you know there's no reason to go in there it like doesn't really offer much shelter from the sun but it's like cool vampire atmosphere <laughs> <laughs> right so you put one of these basins in and the mist will give you a little bit of shelter and make the area all spooky ah and, it's neat yeah, and it feel you feel safe. Um, my first gripe with the game is the progression is incredibly linear. Um, you don't level up in this game. Interesting enough, that like that's a weird choice. Instead, all of your power. I mean, you do gain power, but it all comes from your gear. So it's all hmm. about getting better gear, so you can get better gear, so you can get better gear. And the progression is very much locked. Like, you have to get tier one stuff. And that'll unlock this building. And then you can use that building to build the tier two stuff. And that will enable you to track down an enemy that'll give you access to the tier three stuff. Oh, okay. So there's no creative so thinking involved. None at all. And in fact, you're often groping around like, okay... At one point, I was like, okay, I've got tons, I've got walls now, I've got like a nice base with a stone floor and a coffin to sleep in. This is pretty sweet. How do I get better? Oh, I need a whetstone. Uh, okay, where do I get that? And I look everywhere. I don't, like, can't I just make a whetstone out of uh -huh. any of the hundreds of units of stone like i out all day collecting stone that's one of your major resources but no apparently none of those stones are suitable for rubbing against a piece of metal <laughs> so then i finally find this bandit camp where like one in five bandits will have a wet stone but this place is way too much for me like they're all a little bit too tough for me and you can only fight them in groups so we have to cheese the place really hard, like pull a group of them, kind of run around some trees, get them caught on trees, and then maybe single one of them out and draw him away from the others and fight him alone and maybe get a wet stuff. And I'm like, this is, I died twice fighting these guys. And I'm like, this is completely nuts. I'm walking around with pockets filled with diamonds and rubies and emeralds and I'm dying for lack of a friggin wet stone this is the <laughs> stupidest progression in the world this makes no sense you know it reminds me a lot of project zomboid which is another three-quarter isometric top-down survival building game with an incredibly linear progression that doesn't make a lot of sense if you think about it too hard oh I assume that one is about fighting uh, werewolves. 
Yes, it's about fighting werewolves. So anyway, this might be like a genre thing. I see. Well, I, I actually did find what was going wrong there. There was another bandit camp um, that was much, much easier, and they also had wet stones. So, you know, I just kept looking around and kept looking. It took me several days. The, the day-night cycle actually gets to be kind of annoying it's like you travel around all day you finally find what you're looking for and the sun starts coming up so you have to run back home and now you've got 10 minutes of like oh nothing to do you can't just like sleep through it no you get you can get in the coffin but it doesn't forward time this is my major gripe with the game is it can it's an online it's a multiplayer game right you can host mm. your own server, they have dedicated servers, the whole thing. But since you can be online, you are, and you have to be, always online. So it acts like you're playing an MMO. Ah. And um, that's my major gripe of the game. One thing, yeah, you can't skip the, you can't skip the day. You get in your coffin, and now you're just like... It's like in Minecraft when you get into bed, but you're in a multiplayer server. So like nothing happens You're just, okay. You're in bed now. You've stopped playing the game. Congratulations <laughs> This is functionally identical to exiting the server And I suppose you can't like build a mine so you can work in it during the day or anything Nope, <clears throat> and there isn't that much to do Around your base during the day if you don't you if you've got the resources to build something you build it That's 10 seconds of work and now Okay, you're done for the day like there's not any ongoing work at base that needs to be done So that is a major like problem and the other thing is the inability to pause and In a lot of games that's you know a, a big problem, but even in world of warcraft you can get off the path right like or you can like Oh, I, you know, the phone's ringing. I'll just run over here onto the path. You don't get really attacked on the path. And then you go yeah. deal with your real life stuff. It's not as good as pausing, but it's close enough usually. But in this yeah, game... unless you're in the middle of a raid or something, it's, it's right. trivial to go somewhere where you're safe. That The mobs don't wander around and attack you and stuff. Right. If you're soloing, you can, you can set things up so that you're able to withdraw in you know five to ten seconds you know finish your current fight go to the road and go do your real life stuff and come back <laughs> bio break but the, right exactly this game the enemies wander around and of course the sun might come up and and the sun moves around in the sky like the shadows I mean, you can't just like okay i'll just stand here and i'll be in the shadow of this object the shadow of that object will move all day so you can't walk away from the game ever if you're outside of your base. Ever. You will just die. Something will come along and attack you. Because enemies roam all over the place. Um, or the sun will come up and get you. And so that in a single... When you're just playing single player is super obnoxious. And it drove me crazy today. You know, like it got me several times today. Oh, I'm in the I oh something pops up. Somebody needs my my phone's ringing. Somebody needs my attention. Somebody needs to talk to me. And I'm like, I I I can't I can't I can't pause this game. I am helpless. I'm at the mercy of this game, and I'm not allowed to stop. It is super right. obnoxious. I I really I resent it. I'm kind of yeah. not sure if I should keep going with it. I remember. My brothers and I used to tell our parents that uh, when we were playing games, like, "Oh, I can't, I can't pause this game. Sorry, I have to, I have to keep going." You know, it's dinner time. It's time to do your chores. Oh no, sorry, I can't pause. Right? And it's like, other whether or not we actually could pause. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm playing solitaire. You can't pause this. It's true. You can't pause solitaire. There's no pause functionality yeah. built into the game. But now my kids do not get away with it because I know all the games they're playing and I know which ones have a pause button. <laughs> right. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't let my kids like get way into a game they couldn't pause. And even like Roblox, which is online, it does the World of Warcraft thing where it's like all the games are you can just like wander off at somewhere where you're safe and and do the thing you need to do. Right. 
I just how like obnoxious is it to I understand why it's impossible to pause a game that is online. But actually, if you're playing with friends, I mean, you know, I wouldn't mind if there was pause functionality if I'm playing with my buddies and one of them has his pants catch on fire mid-game. Like, yeah, sure, man. Go ahead, pause the game, put the fire out, maybe put some fresh pants on. Stop, drop, and roll. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'll i be okay with a paused game. Sure. And if the person, if someone jumps, a rando comes on your game for whatever reason, and they keep pausing it for no reason, you kick them, and problem solved. Right. Or you could set that as a as a setting on your server. Say, all right, people can or can't pause. So I, it just, why, why do you do that? That's just a horrible thing. Everybody has to live a real life in the real world. We've all got stuff. Even when I was, you know, we are not all single 20 somethings living on our own without any responsibility. <laughs> like, right. Most of us have stuff we have to worry about and respond to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like a very um, well thought through user experience. I'm assuming it's still in development, hopefully. It is early access. So I'll probably a lot of this. Oh, another funny thing is you asked about moving the camera earlier. Um, you could move the camera by holding down the right mouse button, but there's no way to invert it. So if you're an inverted mouse person like me, you're just stuck with the camera always being backwards. <sighs> so, uh, yeah, I assume, I assume the game will, you know, get more features and get more complete as time goes on. Well, uh, maybe, maybe I should shelve it and come back in like three months and see how it's doing. Sounds like a neat idea. I like the I like the idea of the mechanics playing into the atmospheric playstyle. Right? Oh, I love that too. What I don't like is file extensions. So you've used Microsoft Word before, right? Yes. Sorry to say. <laughs> Back in the day they had the dot doc files. And then like I was it was it after was it in the aughts they changed to docx? The XML enabled doc file or whatever? So is that what the uh, X is? XML enabled. I did not. Uh, I did not uh, know that. The old joke with XML. Do you know how you make um, a ten megabyte XML file? <laughs> you use it to store a megabyte of data. <laughs> yeah. Oh, XML. So I was. Um, I was doing some document stuff at work, and I downloaded a bunch of documents, but they didn't have any file extensions. So I just made them all docx files and tried to open them in in Word. And uh, when you try to open a dot doc file with a dot docx extension, it throws you an error. It's like, we don't know what to do with this file. I don't know what you're trying to accomplish here. Oh, come on, Microsoft. Really? You don't have any header. You can look. You, there's no headers on these files that you can look at. Well, it's interesting that you asked that because I just happened to open up both of the files in a plain text editor. And um, you know how docx is like, it's human readable and machine readable, right? So you've got all these tags and stuff. and yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sort of readable for both. A machine can kind of parse it eventually. And a human uh -huh. can kind of read it if they can be bothered. Yeah. So, uh, so I open up the doc, doc file. And it's like, it's actually kind of readable. Like you can see there's a bunch of plain text in there. There's like, you know, all the document text and there's some gobbledygook in binary or something. Uh, I'm sure it's compressed or whatever. Um, but you can tell right. it, it says right on there. It's like this dot doc file, you know, in plain text. So it's like, there's no reason Microsoft couldn't just read their own file. And like, it's like, oh, this is a dot doc file. Let's just open it up as a doc instead of a doc X. So then I open the doc X file and this is supposed to be XML, right? Um, and it is just wall-to-wall -wall nonsense. Like, there's no human-readable part of this file in any way. I, the whole thing has got to be compressed somehow, because it's just it's just bonkers in there. I don't know what kind of Weird. XML they're writing, but it is just, it's just nutso. It's clown town going on. So... <laughs> So I, I really don't know what they're what they're doing, but like 
if you're going to go through the trouble of adding a, like a four character file extension on your character on your files and make everybody use them um just like have a little bit just like a tiny bit of reverse compatibility because if you change all you have to do is change the doc x you just erase the x off the end and make it a doc and then word will open it just fine it's not like they don't have the capability to read the file so i i don't know i don't understand Here's this might be useful. This might be nonsense. Unfortunately, I can't provide the source for this. This was like back in the aughts. I remember reading somebody's blog who used to be a developer for Microsoft. I can't remember who they are or what they're, you know, I can't remember the context. It's pretty hard to remember a blog you post you read 15 years ago. Yeah. But I do remember this individual said. He was addressing the idea that I still believe that Microsoft deliberately um, made their doc into the doc or the docx, whatever is the newer format. Yeah, uh, docx is newer. Um, constantly evolving, undocumented, obfuscated nonsense on purpose to break compatibility to keep people in their ecosystem oh yeah i i wouldn't put it past them at all um I, I mean that just sounds like classic i mean that really is microsoft's game plan get you in their ecosystem and trap you there that's yeah i mean that's been their strategy for a quarter century now at least um so this person, this guy, was like, look, it's not a conspiracy theory. Microsoft isn't trying to trick you. The doc format was designed um, so that you would be fast to save your file. Like, when you're, okay, th this would have been, you know, I read this 15 years ago, but it was an old post even then. So this was something t in the 90s or whatever. Right. And he was saying look, you know, your computer's really slow, it takes for you know it takes forever to solve, to save one of these files. It would be so much worse, except the doc file has the ability, ability to, like, append quick changes to the end of a file, so it doesn't have to write the entire document into the file every time. When you do these little mm -hmm. saves in the middle of writing, um... It's sort of doing uh, a diff. He he didn't call it this, but that's that's what he was talking about. Like just so the the format of the file. You can imagine how that would make the file format more complicated. Is I need the ability to append a change to the end of a file that can revise the document as previously defined in that same file. Sure. So like make it here's all the faster to save, but then slower to open because you'd have to read the whole file in before you knew what anything went where. Right, exactly. But the thinking was you you know, while you're working, you want saving to be really seamless and quick because you don't want to break your workflow. And you save fifty times for every time you load. Yeah. Um, fair. It made a lot of sense, but I mean, like, it's a completely plausible claim. Totally makes sense. But, I mean, we know Microsoft, and we know how they behave, so it was always like, well, that's plausible, but I still don't believe you. Yeah, is that the reason or the justification? It's like, it's like this convicted murderer who's been convicted for several murders, but he's got a really good alibi for this one. It's like, all right, he's got a good alibi, but I still kind of think he did it. This is <laughs> right. his M.O. Oh, man. And then some of them were some of them were spreadsheet files, so they were XLSX files, and uh, and same thing, right? Like, there's no reason that you shouldn't be able to just have Word kick it over and open Excel. Like, you don't. Nobody owns right. just a copy of Word. Like, they sell it as a package deal. Like, this thing should be a whole right. ecosystem, so that you don't have to worry about it. And then it just seamlessly fixes the file extension, and moves on with his day, right? Like, I don't understand why this, they make this so difficult. All right. Um, here, I'll announce this because I know it's been ages since um, I've posted anything to the blog. You know, it's been a rough few weeks for me. I um, had surgery. 
I began dialysis. I've gone through some life-changing stuff in the past few weeks. Hmm. And uh, I'm trying to get back into the swing of working again. So, uh, I don't know why I did this. But, you know, I didn't <laughs> have any game to, like, do a retrospective on. So what I did is I've written a, like, a plot outline for a, a, a proposed Deus Ex game. Okay. Like, like based on the original two Deus Ex games or, like, the entire series? Uh, based on, hey, this series needs to be rebooted. Here's how I would do it. Ah. Like, rather than just, like, continuing to tell this convoluted story where we have now have sequels and prequels, and really only the first game in the series is a real classic, and the rest of the games have been, like, chasing that high and failing. Yeah. Or compromising, you know. Um, so I'm just sort of like, here's how I would reboot the series. I don't know if anybody has any interest in this. I wrote this for Catharsis. Um, I hope everybody's into it. It'll begin soon. Cool. So this is this is a return to form uh, in the form of fan fiction, essentially. Oh, that's true. I did kind of get... I did sort of start um, with fan fiction, with Free Radical. So, yeah. I guess this is... This is much shorter than Free Radical. This is not, you know... A short story it's sort of like a list of here's what you would do in this mission and here's the facts you would learn like it's like an outline for a design document I guess oh, fun well we'll see <laughs> good what do you say we do some mailbags okay dear diecast how important do you think save systems are in a video game etc etc are there any games where you played and thought, why does this not have a save system? Or why is the save system like this? Kind regards, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm trying to think of a game. I know I've run into this before where, you know, you have one of those games that's continuously saved instead of like having a save slot. You just get the one save that it just constantly updates. Right. It's like a rolling checkpoint kind of thing. Right. I know um, a recent example for me is Potion Craft, uh, because it has a save system, but the save slots are not labeled in any way. They're just like save one, two, three, four, and five. Oh, and boo! there's no information on what you have saved in there. There's no information if you have a saved game in there or not. Uh, it's just like, here are some slots. Good luck remembering what you put in there. And <laughs> like you play a new game and you want to save it. And it's like, oh crap, which one has my like long run 400 day run where I unlocked everything? I don't want to save over that. I, uh, uh, where is it? Yeah, I can't think of a, usually games are pretty good about what system they use. Like Borderlands, I would not want Borderlands to have a, save system like quake where you can just save anywhere and reload the game like borderlands works like diablo where you just have that continuous rolling save that single slot and then there is sure you know a, a game that can't end yeah um infinite respawns sure why would you need to save right why do you if you can't get if you can't get stuck then Save slots have the problem with, what if I save just before I die? Yeah. I didn't realize I was about to die of poison. I hit save. Oh, that was my only slot. Oh, now I guess I just start the game over. <laughs> right. And get a save file editor. At um, the other end, there's like, um, I forget what it's called, but it's this puzzle game that I was playing recently. And it has infinite undo per level. So you can play any level you want, and in every level, your progress is like infinite undo. And then on top of that, it has saves so that you can like undo back somewhere, try a different path, save there, undo back again, try a different path, save there, and then like switch between those two different paths to try out different routes and things. And again, like that's not perfect for every game, but for a puzzle game where it's it super matters in what order you do things, 
it's just fantastic. Like it's, it's so so nice. Yeah. So I don't really, I don't mind uh, save systems. I think games are pretty good about choosing save systems. My big beef with with save systems is when checkpoint saves, one way checkpoint saves combined with collectibles. I think we've talked about this before. Oh yeah. Oh, there's collectibles in this area, uh, and then you know I, oh maybe there's a collectible over here. Oh no. That triggered a cutscene that sucked me into the next level. I had saved over my game, so now I can't go back and get those items. Uh, that uh, is super... So, in fact, that's what kept me from playing Enslaved. That's uh, like a this platformer. Um, stars... Uh, hmm. What's his name? That played Gollum? Andy Serkis? Of the Ape. Yeah, Andy Serkis. Uh, he, he did the lead character mocap like he, he he does the protagonist he does all the mocap and voice for it and of course i want to check that out but like i know there's collectibles in the game and everybody complained about i was looking for collectibles and i just walked too far down this hallway and whoosh, next level you can't go back it's saved over your checkpoint and that has kept Ugh. me from playing that game like I just gave it a pass because I knew that would that would just create this endless anxiety. Yeah, it, there's something about there's something about the checkpoint system that really needs a a super linear level. Like it works for I don't know uh, Sonic the Hedgehog games, right? Like where there's just one path through the level, or maybe there's a, a few paths, but there's like a bottleneck every once in a while, and you get to checkpoints like cool got to the checkpoint I can move forward from here but when you've got an open world thing where you're trying to collect stuff checkpoints are just not the right answer right if nothing else they should be you know if there's if this is like a funnel okay everybody has to go through this this choke point to get to the next area make it you know a golden door and everybody knows golden door means you're moving on to the next I don't mean it has to be a literal golden door but like some thing that is always the same and so as soon yeah. as you see this object you'll know don't approach it until you're ready to move on and just that's the the gameplay designer's way of signaling hey this is the end of the level so if you if you want to look for collectibles don't come this way yet yeah um, and if you want to be really nice to the player uh have a little menu where you can look up like how many collectibles are in the area and how many you have right? so far oh yeah Dishonored 2, you had to finish the level before it would tell you you missed one. <laughs> I was thinking of that exact thing where it's like, don't taunt the player with, like, their failure immediately upon committing to finish the level. Like, that's the opposite of, of playing by the rules. Right, like, somehow my, my character evidently knows there's a painting they didn't get somewhere, so why didn't they act on it sooner? <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, also, because of consoles, we don't get to save our game. We don't get to name our saves anymore. Back in the old day, we could name a save game. This is the start. Oh, this is that tricky side quest I was doing. Um, but like, you, nobody wants to type words on a console. So now, like, you just save, and and the saves are named by like when you saved them. Oh, the timestamp. Oh, yeah, this is my July 5th game. Oh, I, good thing I know exactly what I was doing on July 5th. And it, there's a tiny little it, thumbnail of the of the game screen that it takes when you save the game. And it's just the back of the character's head. Yeah, the back of the character's head standing in front of a checkpoint, right? That all look exactly <laughs> the same. Right. <laughs> it's like, thanks for that, all right. Well, I know that... 1.30 a.m. I evidently saved this game three weeks ago. I wonder what I was doing. If only I could name the save. They should just put uh, speech to text in there. It wouldn't be hard. <laughs> All my saves would be like, you little shit. This boss sucks. <laughs> just let me all this swearing. Or just incomprehensible. <laughs> As you get all tilted. <laughs> Lose my mind after dying to the boss four times and like go cross-eyed. Okay, uh, 
games that should have save systems, multi-stage like fighting games need to have a save system so you can save between stages of the boss fight. I understand not being able to save in the middle of a boss fight, but like you've got to be able to save between stages. It, like, don't make me fight the first stage 12 times so that I can finally fight the second stage and beat that one. It's just, no. Yeah. I know some games are pretending to be arcade games. Um, Ikaruga comes to mind, where I, I don't think there's a save system in Ikaruga at all. It's just, like, you start the game and, like, as far as you can get. Um, and I understand for there being, like, a, like a Steel Man, like, solid playthrough mode or something... But again, like, there's got to be a practice mode where I can play the level, like, you don't have to give me every level all at once, but, like, if I get to a level, let me start there, and so I can practice it, so that I can get good at it. I don't want to be, like, the world top tier expert at level 1, just so that I can get to level 12 consistently, oh, so. That's what made me quit playing Strafe. Oh, I loved, I loved the art design of Strafe so much. But it was just, you know, play a level, play the first level for like the first set of levels for 20 minutes to get to the second one. And it just, oh, it was so, br the fall off was so steep. Like you'll play the first level 50 times and you'll play the second one five times and you'll get to the third area once. And it's just like, I want to practice that third area. So that when right. I do get there again, you know, I can enjoy I can enjoy the run and uh, you know, and so I don't have to I want to I'm so bored of level one of the the first set of levels. I'm just I've seen it. It's exhausting and I, I need to move on dungeon crawlers and roguelikes uh, and everyone makes the excuse like oh if you had a save system then you could cheese it and like, you know, scout out all the areas and figure out where all the best loot is in the level and then reload and do all those things without using a bunch of resources and like fair but all of these games have procedural generation so there's no reason you couldn't allow the player to save at the level and when they reload at that level it just regens the level based on a different random seed like and then you can't cheese it anymore like just don't throw away all of my progress but then people could cheat well people can use cheat engine are you going to stop people from cheating? I mean, it's their computer. They have full control. They'll use Cheat Engine and give themselves whatever they need, infinite health or ammo or whatever they want. People can cheat. So don't right. inconvenience people just trying to play the game in the name of trying to stop cheaters. That's just as ridiculous as trying to stop pirates. And yeah, and, well, and even more ridiculous, because in this case, the cheaters have hardware access. Like, the there's no way you can stop them. Like you said, there's, there's, it's ridiculous to even try. Right. So all games should have save systems, I guess, is what we're saying. Yeah. Doesn't need to be save anywhere, but it does need to respect the player's time. Dear DieCast, do you have any advice for those of us just starting out blogging via WordPress, whether traction-wise or to do with hosting options and precautions or whatever else you think are important things to do and consider? I'd be interested to know with, with what wisdom you have to share on the subject. Kind regards, Andrew again. Thanks again, Andrew. I don't know that I do have much in the way of advice. Back in the day when there was like a bunch of different blogging platforms and a bunch of different options, you know, I had all kinds of advice, but the, there's like hardly any choices to make these days. It's like you just, you, you install the thing and then there, there, that's, you're done. <laughs> Right. I mean, I mean, but like traction wise and like doing promotion and stuff, uh, I, I know I'm just garbage at all of that. Like I run two blogs and it's impossible and blogs are dead. Abandon all but, hope, Andrew. Um, it, it's a shame. I think it's a great form. I think it's so I think it is vastly superior to social media for connecting with people and reading it like the the quality of your average blog post is vastly superior to the quality of your average Facebook post or your average tweet orders of magnitude better um, but the social media platforms have just come in and kind of displaced blogging it's like that 
oh, here I have five minutes in front of my computer. What do I do with these five minutes? I'll go scroll Reddit. You know, it used to be I'll, I'll read the blogs that I have in my blog roll or, you know, in my bookmarks, and that's just not a thing anymore. I'm very lucky to have some people that are that can are willing to continue to humor me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat except without the readership. So I I can't offer any useful advice except I guess well and this is true for you as well, I think. Um write what you're interested in and don't care if nobody reads it cuz that's the only way to get started. That's how I got started. I wrote for like over a year before I think things took off. Might have been might have been a year and a half. I can't remember when DM of the Rings started. But I think DM of the Rings was like 2007, and I began the blog in 2005. And even then, DM of the Rings got a bunch of people coming to the site. But it wasn't really the audience... I don't want to say it wasn't the audience I wanted. I was grateful to have people reading. But it wasn't like... You know, those folks were just there for... You know, they would read the comic and hit the back button. They weren't, you know, they weren't around to read my stuff. Really, the blog, as me writing about video games and programming, I think really got its life from my escapist days, maybe? I don't know. Okay. Write about what you care about and don't mind if nobody reads it, and then sell out. Right. That's important. you got to sell out. Don't forget to do that. <laughs> Early and often. Dear Diecast, Considering it just had its digital release last week, has become A24's highest grossing film, is already a contender for movie of the year, and has become an all-time favorite for a lot of people, have you guys seen everything, everywhere, all at once? And if you have, what are your thoughts on it? Love, Pumpkin. Thanks, Pumpkin. I don't even know what the movie's about. I All I know is the title. I see the title popping up on YouTube here and there, people talking about it. I don't know what it's about. I don't know who's in it. I don't know what's going on. Um, so I, my opinion is worth less than nothing. I don't even remember the title from when I read this mailbag earlier in the week. So like, I have not ever heard of this ever, not even once. Nothing, nowhere, never. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody, nowhere, at no time. So, sorry. I did watch The Batman. I, we already talked about that. Yeah, I, I wish I could say that I wish I had anything to say, but I don't even wish that. It's... Oh, dear Diecast, I just realized that, with Microsoft having acquired ZeniMax, I can purchase Bethesda ZeniMax games again. My boycotts are Ubisoft and EA for single-player games, always on online DRM and proprietary launchers, ZeniMax, backstabbed and then tried to acquire a weakened Human Head Studios during their production of Prey 2, and Diablo 3, always online DRM for single player. Do you guys practice boycotts that you would like to talk about? Have you ever given up on a boycott? I'm beginning to feel that I had, I'd have to boycott almost any entire gaming industry with my stance against always online requirements versus Google Stadia and Microsoft xCloud, and I might have to bend on that one eventually. Curiously, Chris. Thanks, Chris. So if I boycotted the companies that I really strongly object to, um, I would have to boycott EA, Ubisoft, what, what's the other big one? For all, and ZeniMax for all their Sue Happy Laws, Suit Ways, and Activision. Like, that's just too much. Like, that's just, <laughs> that's just 80% of the hobby. I mean... Valve doesn't make enough stuff to keep me going. <laughs> I need more than one game every five years. Right, especially since you've kind of focused on AAA, high-budget stuff. Uh, obviously, there's a ton of indie stuff out there. Right, and I'm not in, 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 into Nintendo. Mm. So, I mean, the, so, and it, but I, so I don't boycott the stuff. I just can't, you know? I mean, and really that that's sort of counterproductive because it's like my job, like one of the big draws is when I bitch about these companies. And so technically their awfulness is, you know, keeps me, keeps me going. Uh, I sort of depend on them to suck. <laughs> it fuels a lot of people come, come to me for comfort, you know, 
All right, Seamus, explain why this sucks. It's just cathartic to hear. We know it already, but it's cathartic to hear. Um, but having said that, I did have kind of been boycotting Blizzard Activision. Just like, just um, their labor practices and the super scummy way that Bobby Kotick has been behaving for the last however long. I'm not even sure when it started. But it just like it's not like a principled boycott. It's just sort of this. Ugh, I just feel awful every time I see the Activision Blizzard logo, and so I I try not to look at it. Hmm. So it's not really a boycott. It's just. Ugh. It's that does like, explain why you haven't heard of Sylph. <laughs> right, right. It's kind of like if if your dog died. At McDonald's for some reason. You might not want to go to McDonald's anymore. Even other McDonald's mm. that had nothing to do with the death of your dog. It's just ugh, bad memories. Yeah. I don't think I've bought... Yeah, I have not bought uh, a Blizzard game since I bought World of Warcraft on pre-order. That, that was the last Blizzard game I bought. And it wasn't like wow. an intentional boycott. It was just like... This is that was the end of my my interest in their offerings. So it's I haven't I bought anything like that. And then like oh yeah oh what really really just was appalling to me was um, I forget now, but I remember just Kodak just sort of like prostrating himself before China. Like I can understand being a little mercenary and wanting to go in there and you know make make some money but just being able to go above and beyond to make china happy while you're at the same time just absolutely making your core customers here in the west livid and miserable and the people that have worked for you for decades making them livid and miserable it's like what are your priorities man do you think China loves you? Do you think they wouldn't? Do you think they wouldn't just shut you down on a whim? Yeah, and it hasn't turned out super great for him, so... No, no. And then it's not really games, but I don't buy anything that Adobe makes. Um, again, not super out of principle, but just like there are open source alternatives and their software is kind of garbage. So, oh, Adobe, you can't buy Adobe stuff, can you? You can only rent it now. Well, nowadays, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I am sort of boycotting things that you can't buy, you can only rent, because that's a tariff. I mean, I used to use that all the time as a rhetorical, you can't even buy this game, they'll just rent it to you. But it was, I was being sarcastic, like, isn't that horrible? Isn't the idea of that horrible? But now that's like, no, some people are want to make that their business model for real. We want you to pay us yeah. every month for this software that you'll use twice a year. Oh, awful. I, I love Blender's model, which is, here's the software for free, we're going to keep developing it, and please donate to us. And they've got, like, tens of thousands of dollars every month, people donating to them to keep it going i think a big secret of that is um the <clears throat> knowing how to keep your company small active world mm, survived yeah. as long as it did because the, you know we never we never had more than 12 people you stay small uh what is it one of the um music software programs uh muse score oh music no, yeah that one too muse Muse score is like a really tiny team. And that's how you survive. You can survive on like donations or very small purchase price. But too many people like, well, I'm going to start a company and I'm going to have a thousand employees. And, and uh, I mean, Facebook is a classic example. Like they've done nothing but, you know, they they began running the Facebook 
And then they just kept hiring people and kept hiring people. And there are now thousands of people, but the product hasn't changed that much. And it's very easy for just people to build these entire kingdoms that do almost nothing. I mean, the people work every day. They go to work. They write a bunch of code. That code gets checked in, gets checked. People inspect it. They argue over the design. They revise it. They patch it. They put it, but it's like not doing anything for your bottom line, right? And you just got all these projects yeah. going everywhere and you don't know what kind of value they're creating. And um, so you just have this giant bureaucracy. And, and so you need to make tons of money to feed that. And the overexpand. I mean, this is this is a hum This is a human thing. You get it in governments, companies. You get it in groups within companies. Everybody wants to sit at the top of a big hierarchy. Somebody forms yeah, a committee and then you go around. Yeah, somebody forms. You know, oh, we have a problem. Okay, well, I'll form a committee. And now I'm going to get a whole bunch of people to join the committee, and we're going to have meetings, and it's like. The problem was, hey, there's sometimes litter around the school. You could go out once a week and just pick up all the friggin' litter. Or you can get 20 people onto your anti-litter committee and you could like make signs and posters and doing uh -huh. all this stuff to get... Yeah, put loot. up flyers and get like volunteers to come on site two times a month to pick up litter. And they're picking up all the flyers that you printed out, right. falling exactly. on the ground. Exactly. It's like the initial pro you. Yes, you're solving the problem, but you're using like an order of magnitude more manpower than is required to solve it because you can't help but think it's like almost like people have to think on this tribe level, like or like an army level. Well, if you've got. If you're working alone, you want somebody to help you. If you've got a couple of people helping you, you'd rather have a bunch of people helping. If you've got a bunch of people helping you, then you dream of being a great big manager with a hundred people under you. And yeah. If there isn't a check on that, then um, companies just bloat and expand. Um, companies or you know uh, governments, anything, anything run by people will expand to consume whatever resources are available. So true. Giants. We create giants. We have two questions left, but I feel like we've done a show. All right, yeah. I think we have. All right. Well, thank you to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, um, now's a good time to send it in because the mailbag's almost empty. Our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, and thanks to Isaac again for editing this show. It's nice to have him back. I know I paused the show for like 20 minutes while I looked up Andy Circus's name, so thanks for cutting all that out, Isaac.